At age 25, Ryan Avery became the youngest world champion of public speaking in history. He competed against more than 30,000 people from 116 countries to win the championship. Ryan is now the managing partner at How to Be a Speaker, where he speaks more than 50 times a year across the world to help young business professionals develop and deliver their message. He is an Emmy Award winning journalist and today you can pre-order his new book published by McGraw Hill Business titled Speaker, Leader, Champion, How to Succeed at Work Through Public Speaking. Please help me welcome the youngest world champion of public speaking in history, Ryan Avery. Ryan, get to my office right now! You ever had a boss yell at you like that before? If you say no, you're probably sitting next to your boss. <laughs> I had a boss yell at me like that when I was at Special Olympics Oregon. And the worst part about that is you think, what did he find out about? So <laughs> I go to his office, he says, Ryan, how many people did you send this email to? I said, only a few, boss, why? Go back to your office, fix every last spelling error, and make this better. And I'm thinking, spelling error? <laughs> I know I did not spell anything wrong, because I typed everything in Microsoft Word. <laughs> I go back to my office, and at that time, I was their director of marketing and communications. So it was my job to launch a new online store for us. And I, I sent out a test email with a variety of different products in the email, and in the subject line, I write, order your special Olympics shirt now. That is what I thought I wrote. <laughs> However, there is a big difference when you leave the letter R out of shirt. <laughs> yeah, you laugh now. You laugh now. Order your Special Olympics now. Not the best <laughs> mistake to make when you're the Director of Marketing and Communications. <laughs> That's sinking in for some of y'all right now. I share that with you because it's the little things that make a big difference, isn't it? In anything and everything we do, it's those little things that make a big difference, and that's what we're going to talk today about. I'm going to give you a handful of strategies and little things that can make a big difference in your speaking career. You excited about that? Yeah. Okay, I am excited to be here. This is my first time in Grand Rapids. What, what? <laughs> I am pumped, and this is my first snow of the season. So I'm from Texas originally, and we do not get snow. So every time I see it, I feel like I'm in a snow globe. And it's, it's just really nice to be here. Okay, we're going to do a couple things first. If you are able to, please stand up. I want to see how many people are speaker ready in the room. And this is what I call speaker ready because I have seven questions to ask you. I have seven questions to ask you, and when you say no to one of the seven that I am going to ask you, you sit down, okay? If you say yes to it, you sit, remain standing. If you say no, you sit down. Now, if you are already sitting down, you may not stand back up for the next question. <laughs> I'm gonna watch some of you, okay? All right, your first one is, you believe your voice matters. Yeah. Okay, good, that's the best one. All right, good, good, good. Next one. You speak with confidence every time you get on stage. <laughs> all right, well, about half of the room. Okay, all right, we got some confidence to work on. Okay, you know your audience, the problem that they have, and a solution for that audience. Perfect, so if I ask you, you'll know your audience and your solution. Okay, a couple more people sit down. Cool, okay, fourth one. You have a formula for engaging presentations that you can use over and over and over again. Ah. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about that today. We still have about 10% of the room left, so let's see these next questions. You can make people laugh when you're on stage. You're funny, and you know how to build appropriate humor. <laughs> appropriate humor. A couple of people sit down there. Okay, okay. <laughs> 
I love it. All right. Still a couple people. You can make five hundred to five thousand dollars when you speak. Hey, don't laugh. You can make a lot of money using your voice. You can use, make a lot of money using your voice. You still have three speakers, and you're considered a leader in your industry. All right, let's give it a round of applause for the three people who are speaker ready in the room. Woo! Okay, so you three can go. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Listen, if, if you three don't learn something new today, I'll each pay you 50 bucks. Deal? I'm worth a lot more. Oh, you're worth a lot <laughs> All right. All right. There's that confidence. She was standing on that confidence question. All right. Well, today I can't teach you all of these things. I'm only here for two hours. I usually teach this in a three-day workshop or in my kit. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to teach you the formula for engaging presentations. You're going to walk out of here with a formula that you can use over and over and again to keep your audience engaged and excited when you speak. It's the formula that I use to win the world championship. It's a formula that I use to build my keynotes, and you're going to have it when you walk out of here. You excited about that? Yeah. yeah? It took me a year to figure it out. I'm going to give it to you in two hours. Woo! Okay, what we're going <laughs> to do first is we are going to watch two videos. We're going to watch my world championship speech. And we're going to watch, who, who hasn't seen my world championship speech? Oh, oh, nice. Okay, we're going to watch my world championship speech. And then we're going to watch a speech called Push Past It. And that was a speech that I gave at the semifinals. But within this video, it's one that I delivered in front of 2,000 high school sophomores. Okay? So we are going to, yeah, sophomores. Talk about, talk about keeping them engaged. Okay? Getting them engaged. That's true. All right, so here is Trust is a Must. Can everyone hear it? Louder. Louder. I'm at the altar, sweating in my wool suit. She is glowing in her white dress. Ask me the most important question of my life. Before I make my commitment, I let my mind rewind like an old school VHS tape. And it takes me back to high school when I would plead with my mom to let me go to parties. Mom, please let me go. There will be no alcohol, I promise. <laughs> mom in her nightgown and bunny slippers smiled sweetly. All right. I trust you. Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, anybody who's ever lied to mama before. <laughs> We're having fun in a field of small town Texas. My friend Taylor passes me another beer when <laughs> lights freeze us in place. The man behind the light, big belly over a belt buckle, lip full of dip, sheer of snodgrass. Caught us red-handed, red solo cups in hand. <laughs> Boys, it's your lucky night. Either fill this bag to the top with cigarette butts, or we start calling mamas. <laughs> he cracked that bag, and there we were, three macho teenagers, Taylor, Eric, and, well, two macho teenagers. <laughs> Crawling in the semi-sober space, collecting soggy cigarette butts all night. Next morning, we took that bag, we dropped it off at the station. There is some angry southern woman yelling in a nightgown and bunny slippers. <laughs> <laughs> like a human bulldozer, mom plows through the crowd. Stunned? What happened? Mom. If you ever worried about me smoking, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, and I had to pick up five pounds of cigarette butts. Why, Ryan? There was alcohol at the party, Mom. No, no, I'm disappointed. Worse, I can't believe you. Trust is a must. Times have 
change. When Dad and I were your age, we picked up seven. <laughs> <laughs> It took me a long time to earn Mom's trust back. And after a summer of her house arrest, it was my senior year and I became a wannabe entrepreneur. This man offered me buckets of money to build him a website. New car, here I come. I spent weeks hunched in a chair, glued to a screen, typing on a Cheeto-stained keyboard. <laughs> I finished. We met, handed over the files. He checked for his checkbook couldn't find it. Promised he would send a check over immediately. No problem. We shook hands. I'll get paid in a couple days. Well, a couple days passed. And where I'm from, handshakes mean something. I call him. His phone's disconnected. I Google him. He gave me a fake name. What? I complained to mom, and you know what she said? Trust is a must. Isn't it, son? Don't you hate when parents are right? <laughs> like one of those annoying hotel alarm clocks, it woke me up. <coughs> How was I supposed to expect a man to keep a handshake when I couldn't even keep a promise to mom? I learned a promise is only as good as the person who makes it. I was finally able to leave small town Texas and I went to college in Colorado. And I met the girl. Tall, curly hair, a tattoo or two. <laughs> <laughs> she is beautiful and I'm just some punk with pimples. And after a few hours of laughing, she is bringing home to mama material. A couple dates later, I was up front and honest, Chelsea, I'm not looking for a girlfriend, I'm looking for a wife. I'm leaving the country, won't be back for seven months, and I want kids. Warning, though, this 12 pounds at birth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mom. <laughs> I have no idea how I convinced that girl to be my girlfriend, but I did. When we started building our foundation of trust 3,000 miles apart, I wrote her a handwritten letter every day while I was gone. I doodled what our future kids would look like. <laughs> Green, still holding her hand at 90. Decided, no bunny slipper. <laughs> when I got back home, I met with Chelsea's parents, and I got that seal of approval. I told them, one day, I'll have more business experience. I'll do my best raising a couple 12-pound babies. <laughs> I will love that girl. Her curls turn great. For the wedding, my mom reminded me that trust is a must. I want this marriage to last. I am at the altar, sweating in my wool suit, and Chelsea is glowing in her white dress. Chelsea, I promise. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Morning after I won. I, we woke up to 269 emails asking us to speak and, and train. And we still get emails every week, very common. Ones are, does Chelsea really have four tattoos? <laughs> yes, she does. I'm not telling you where they are. <laughs> Chelsea is here, by the way. She's right here. Chelsea, everybody. Woo! Another question that we get is, hey, how did you and Chelsea meet? And can I share that story with you? Yes. Okay, we were, yeah, can I share that story with you? <laughs> we were 19 years old. We were at this huge college party, and I'm squished in a kitchen talking to this one other girl who I've kind of known for a bit, but don't really know her. 
admits it, and this girl's like, you don't know my name, do you? And I'm like, of course I know your name. And I did not know her name. <laughs> and Chelsea was behind that girl. And Chelsea mouthed, her name is Amy. And she mouthed the word Amy to me. And I was like, your name is Amy. And the girl was like, my name is Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's how I landed Chelsea. <laughs> I see this Toastmaster logo, and this Toastmaster logo means a lot to me because Toastmasters has changed my life tremendously. How many non-Toastmasters do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Raise them high. Wow. Awesome. 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 Okay. For all the non-Toastmasters in the room, I just want to make a point real quick. All the Toastmasters in the room, raise your hand. Okay, you see all those hands? Okay, please put them down, thank you. All right, Toastmasters, if you wish you would have joined Toastmasters earlier, please raise your hand. Aha, see that? So all of you who are thinking about joining or don't really know the benefits of it, do it. Join, it will change your life, it will change your career, and look at the people that you get to be surrounded by, top quality people. And you can go to toastmasters.org, you can type in your zip code, and there are phenomenal clubs here in District 62 for you to join, okay? So I want you to join, because it's an amazing organization. All right, the next one that we are going to, actually before I do that, I, I have to thank a couple people, because I just saw Carol's face. Carol, because <laughs> I saw Carol's face right there. First up, where is Greg? Greg? What's up? Greg is the event chair for this. A round of applause for that one. Thank you. And Greg had a phenomenal team. There was like 13 people. If you helped volunteer with this event, can you please stand up? Look at all the people who helped. Look at all the people who got. Ken and John and Liz. Doug and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I got to call out the trio, the district trio. We got Carol, Lori, and Amy. Woo! Thank you, thank you so much. Those, that's all volunteer. And District 62 made this event happen for free, which I think is amazing. So thank you for making that happen. Thank you. Thank you all so much. All right, next speech we're going to watch is called Push Past It. Ready? ready. Come on, Grand Rapids, you ready? Ready! Tell my parents my dream had drowned. 
I open the front door. Before I can even speak, Grandma hands me the letter of a lifetime. I have dreamt of opening this letter. My whole family gather around for opening ceremonies. What does it say? What does it say? Dear Ryan, thank you for submitting your application to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We regret <laughs> to inform you that blah, blah, blah. Is it really necessary to write three more paragraphs after that sentence? <laughs> Frozen in uncomfortable silence, Grandma grabbed my wrist, leaned in. Ryan, we all get rejected. Push back. Besides, who really wants to live in North Carolina anyway? <laughs> For months, I felt like I was living in an infomercial. Have you ever been? <laughs> yeah. Are you experiencing repeated rejection? <laughs> <laughs> Others moving at a faster pace than you. Shame. <laughs> then call right now and start to feel better about the inner you. It took me a long time to remind myself that I could be the first person in my family to graduate. And five years later, I earned two degrees right here for my new dream school at Colorado State University. Woo! After graduating, I jumped from temp job to contract job to no job. And I was broke. Scary broke, and I called Grandma for help. You need money? Well, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> After submitting over 75 applications, I finally landed a job with a consistent paycheck. Every stage of our lives, we face fears and obstacles we push past. Starting young with that large, hairy monster living under our bed. Building up courage to walk into that first high school classroom or to face the day when we lose someone that we love. Grandma is not the same person she once was. The woman who has always been there for me comforts me in that familiar perfume that slides me a cookie before dinner. <laughs> will look right at me and forget who I am. <coughs> Grandma is still here, but she's already gone. At the age of nearly 90, her lesson is real. Push past it, because life is limited. But we don't have to limit life. I pushed past North Carolina and discovered my beautiful wife right here at Colorado State University. I pushed past my fear of heights and discovered the thrill and terror of bungee jumping. I pushed past being broke and broke into a job that fuels me. Every bridge of fear we all stand on starts that same mental countdown. Am I really about to do this? Yes. I am not ready for this. If not now, when? Why do I listen to Grandma? Because life is limited. Push past it. It's always interesting for me to see how different audiences react to certain speeches in certain parts. I was giving this same speech to a bunch of Harvard grads, and afterwards they came up to me, a few of them, and said, oh, Ryan, 
we thought it was hysterical that we thought your, you thought your dream college was Colorado State. <laughs> I was like, what? It was, thank you. This is awkward now. <laughs> okay, you have workbooks in front of you? I want every single person to be taking notes in this room. I want you to take notes because if you don't, you will remember less than 10% of what I tell you. If you do take notes, you'll remember 40% of what I tell you. And I really do want you to walk out of these doors remembering how to make it a great speech. That's what I'm here to help you with today, okay? And there are three things, by the way, it's burning up in here. Can I take this jacket off? Oh. <laughs> Wow. All right, Carol, I'm married. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, there's three things you need to know when you're making a speech. And the first is you need to keep it simple. Simple always wins. And right now I'm going to share some little things that can make a big difference in the simple categories for your speaking. First is you need a structure, right? We've all heard that you need an intro, a body, a conclusion, right? But we're never taught really what parts of the intro, and body, and conclusion you need. First thing, your intro and your conclusion should tie back together. Wherever you pick them up, drop them off. So many people, they'll start their speech here, and they'll end it over here, and we don't even know that they're concluding. Where was I at the beginning of Trust is a Must? At the altar. By the way, this is not going to be a monologue today. It's going to be a dialogue. Okay? I want you to engage with me. I'm here for you. But shout out some answers. If you have questions, if you don't understand what I'm saying, say, hey, Ryan, can you repeat that? Okay? I'm here for you. Where was I at the beginning of Trust is a Must? At the altar. Where was I at the end? At the altar. Where was I at the beginning of Push Past It? Bungee jumping. Any people bungee jumped here before? Yeah, don't do it. Okay? <laughs> don't do it. Where was I at the end? Bungee jumping. Tie your intro back into your conclusion. And what that does is it lets your audience know that you're wrapping up, that you're concluding. And, and it also packages it really nicely. Puts it in, a ni in their lap and they know that you're done. Within the body, you want three stories, not three points. We don't learn through points. We learn through stories, don't we? Before the written word, we only had stories. So don't make points think that I ever once say, here's point one, here's point two, and <laughs> point three is this. No, I just shared simple stories that had points within them, but I shared them through stories. Now here's the kicker, okay? They all have to match the same theme, okay? When you go up on stage, what happens is my clients will send me speeches and there will be like four different messages and themes throughout their speech. We're talking about dreaming big and setting goals and getting out of debt. We as humans like repetition, we like things simple and we like it hit over and over and over again. I've had people take this workshop more than five times before and they tell me even after the fifth time, wow, I learned so much. And this workshop is 90% the same every time. It's because we like repetition and we want, do you want your message to stick? Okay, you've got to stay within the same theme, okay? You have to share those stories. What was my theme in my world championship speech? Trust is a must. A time when I lied, a time when I was lied to, and a time when I discovered lying was no longer important, or ever important, I should say. What was my theme with my grandmother? Push past it. Pushing past fears, pushing past rejection, pushing past being broke. Same theme, three stories, your intro, time back into your conclusion all have a structure. And this, this can be used for a 30 second elevator pitch or a 45 minute keynote. By the way, how many people in here want to be professional speakers? They want to get paid to use their voice. Okay. How many people are here just to learn how to advance in your career through speaking? Okay. Perfect. The strategies that I'll be sharing with you today work for both. Okay, I use these and when I pitched for Special Olympics proposals, I went from $10,000 proposals to $100,000 proposals because I learned how to use my voice. I'm on stage now speaking all over the world with my wife because I learned how to use my voice. So these strategies that I'll give to you today work either one. So you'll hear me say speech or presentation, that's why. Next thing that you need. This was interesting and we discovered this, by the way, I say we, 
Because a lot of people think I'm the world champion of public speaking, which is cool. But what you need to realize is it's not me. It is Chelsea and I are the world champions of public speaking. Chelsea was there since day one with me. She got the, we started training together in January. She is my coach. She is everything. So don't think I'm the world champion. It's us, OK? So we, when I say we, that's the reason I'm not saying I. Chelsea and I wanted to find out what's the difference between first place and everybody else. Why can someone go up and beat 30,000 people and second and third place get second and third place? So what we did is we took the past 25 years of winners. By the way, wow. yeah, 25 years of winners, by the way. I go on tangents, but I, I competed during the 80th anniversary of the contest out of 88 districts. I was speaker number eight at 8 a.m. on August 8, 18th. What? Yeah, what's my new lucky number? Eight, right? Yeah, totally. For the non-Toastmasters in the room, they've been videotaping these speeches at the finals level for the past 25 years. So we got all of those videos. And they were very expensive. <laughs> and, but I kind of struggled with it a little bit. But I'm glad I did because I wouldn't have been able to find this formula out. Because what we wanted to do is we wanted to watch the difference between first, second, and third place for 25 years. So we watched 75 speeches several times. It took a long time, not going to lie to you. <laughs> and we found out something that was really interesting in the difference between first and everybody else. And this is it. Majority of the time, someone, a person, teaches you something. And you cannot be the hero of your own story. You can hold my calls for a second. Thank you. OK? You cannot be the hero of your own story. So who was teaching me in Trust is a Must? My mom. Who was teaching me in Push Past It? My grandmother. Think about this. Do I ever even tell you Trust is a Must? Never once. See, what happens is, first place, they, they went up, and they shared their stories, but someone was teaching them. What happens, second and third place would come up and say, hey, everybody, I have this cool story, but I'm telling you how cool I am. Versus someone still sharing the success. So do you have a speech or a presentation that you still want to get your message across, but where'd you learn it? And just add that person, or it can be a thing or a place that you were reminded of that lesson that you're sharing with us. Does that make sense? OK. This is one of the kickers that we also found, too, is the constant object what we found out in these 75 speeches was there would be a person, place, or thing that would be brought up three times throughout someone's speech. So it's a person, place, or thing. And I'll explain the benefits of it in just a minute. But does anyone know what the person, place, or thing was in Trust is a Must? Well, who said it? No? Who said it? Slippers. Nice. Bunny slippers. Said it three times. What color were the bunny slippers? Were they? I never said. Oh, interesting. We're, we're going to talk about that later, maybe. Hmm. OK, what was the constant object, person, place, or thing in Push Past It? This one's harder. Who said it? Shane, Shane. Person, place, or thing. I brought him up three times. And what happens is that constant objects, it connects all of your stories together and anchors those points and brings your audience along with you constantly. So that constant object is important. Is there an object that you can, a person, place, or thing you can add in your speech or presentation? Next strategy. Got to get some water. It's dry up here, y'all. Ooh, get some water. This next tip I want to give you is the difference between what's called paragraph and poem form. Let me explain what poem form is so you don't think I'm rhyming every line. That would be ridiculous. What poem form is is any time you're writing out a speech and when you're speaking it, if you know where you're going to pause or you take a breath, you press enter on your screen. So it looks like a poem on the page. And I'll tell you the benefits behind that. Who has trouble memorizing their speeches? 
Psh, me too. Right after I won the district contest, they packed a room half this size, double the people. People were like, I brought my entire family to hear you speak, Brian. I'm so excited. And I was like, all right. So I get up. I give my speech for about two minutes. And then I pause. I forget my lines. And I'm frozen for 28 seconds. And I know it's 28 seconds because I have it on video. <laughs> very awkward. Very awkward. Uh, but what I was doing is I was trying to memorize a paragraph. What is harder to memorize, a paragraph or a poem? Paragraph is harder. Easier, poem. You can read a poem and memorize it because of the flow and the melody that comes along with it. Right? You can hear a song, and one time you hear that song, you can know the song because it's built in that melody and that rhythm for you. Another reason why it's good is because when my clients, 99% of the time, they'll send them to me in, my, in paragraph form, and what happens is, you talk so much faster in paragraph form because you read really fast. So I'm at the altar sweating in my wool suit and she's glowing in her white dress. What this does is it builds in the pause for you. I'm at the altar sweating in my wool suit. She is glowing in her white dress. Builds in that pause for you. Because I'm a really fast talker. You a fast talker out there? Yes, so men talk anywhere between 110 and 120. 120 words a minute. Women talk 120, 125. I talk 150 words a minute, so I'm really feminine. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll share this story with you. On the back of your workbooks, there is a place where you'll see a testimonial for me. And if you enjoyed today, I'd love for you to fill out that testimonial, or if you know a company or an organization where you'd like me to come and speak, mark that down and give it to Chelsea in the back. But a couple months ago, a woman, she circled, yes, Ryan, you can use this testimonial for promotional <laughs> materials. And all it said was, Ryan, you're too feminine on stage, man up. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and it really bothered me at first. So have you ever received feedback or someone given you their advice and it just crushes you? Okay, that, it crushed me for a while, but I'm going to give you some advice. Forget them. <laughs> okay? Forget those people. Be you. Okay, be you on stage, be you off stage. Don't try to change you. Look, there are people who are down, and then there are people who like to drag you down, and you need to cut those people out of your life. They have no room in your life. Okay? So get rid of them, because you are special, and you're great, and when you're you, you have more fun. So just be you, don't let anyone try to change you. If you are talking fast though and it's distracting, that's a different thing. And that happens to me sometimes, so I have to slow down. And when I practice with my poem form like this, it helps me speak slower. I used to, I used to practice also underwater. Because when you practice underwater, you speak a lot slower with water in your mouth. Um, and <laughs> when you come up for air, that's where you knew how to pause. <laughs> So all of you who have a pool, you got an advantage. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Do y'all have pools up here? No? <laughs> I don't know. It seems a little cold. It? <laughs> the other reason why paragraph versus poem is great is because in paragraph form, OK, what do you usually do with a paragraph? You read it. Well, when you come up on stage and you practice something that you've been reading, it sounds like you're reading something to the audience. Now, what do you do with a poem? You, you speak. You speak a poem. You recite a poem. When you're practicing a poem form, it comes across as you are speaking and having a conversation with the audience. And isn't that what we want to do as speakers? Write in poem form. Stop writing in paragraph form. This next strategy that I use, how many people want to engage their audience when they're speaking? Everyone's hand should be going up. <laughs> People are like, oh, I guess not. It's okay. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> if you want to engage your audience, engage their senses. What is the number one sense that links us back to our memory? Smell. What do you think the number one sense is that we as speakers leave out of our speeches? Smell. And taste often. Did you smell or taste anything in my speech? No? 
Beer. Cigarette butts, beer, chlorine, perfume, cookies, Cheetos. I mean, the gamut was all right there, right? Have you ever written a speech before where you catch their attention at the beginning and then at the end it kind of dies down? Okay, this is what most likely happens. Print out your poem form and take five highlighters. Assign a highlighter to each sense. Blue is sight, green is sound, pink is taste. And highlight where you make them see things and taste things, smell things. And what you'll see is, at the beginning of my speeches at least, when I was not engaging them at the end, but at the beginning, I had a lot of color on the front pages of my speech. And at the end, it was just blank white pages. Spread those senses throughout and engage your audience by engaging their senses. All I had to do was add a word like cookie or perfume. And instantly, you're linked back to how your grandmother's perfume smells. Or the chocolate chip, were they chocolate chip cookies in your mind? Yeah. Or gingerbread or oatmeal. I'm mean, having so many people think of that. What, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. You want your audience to be working without knowing that they're working. And this is a way that you can do that. That keeps your audience engaged, is by engaging their senses. OK, some people are going to disagree with me on this next statement, and I'm OK with that. I'm OK with that because today I'm here to teach you what works for me, what I do to get paid, what works for me on stage. But whenever you explain something, it is my strong belief that you shouldn't be able to just say, this is why I think so, and not give a reason. Okay. So when you believe something, tell them why it is you believe something. So I'm going to tell you what this next slide is, and then I will tell you why I believe that. Okay? So if you disagree with me on it, I'm fine with that. This is, it, take whatever you want from me today. That's fine. Okay? I'm not wanting to argue with you on this one. I have some people who are like, some people just come up and they, they disagree with me. Write this down. Drop the prop. Drop the prop. And I'll explain why. If I say the word, hey, everybody, look at my basketball here. 99% of the people in the room can see a basketball, right? I don't need a basketball for you to see a basketball. The cool part is, though, you might see a brand new Nike basketball, and you might see your childhood basketball. That is the basketball I want you to see. I want you to use your imagination. So if I came up and I showed a basketball first like this, everyone would be focusing on this basketball. They wouldn't be engaged, and it would no longer be our story. It would be my story. See, my job as a speaker is to engage your memory, is to engage you, is to make it your story. Not me up here and y'all listen. No, it is our story, and you're a part of it. And, and when you do that, you let them use their imagination. Have you, I've, I've, it's been said a lot of times, I prefer radio over television because it creates better pictures. <laughs> right? Have you ever read a book before and then watched a movie and you go, that movie sucked? <laughs> it's because we love our imaginations. Our imaginations are so powerful. Plus, uh, props are distracting. If I brought a basketball up here, it'd be bad news bears, I'm telling you right now. I would dribble, I'd be like, oh. <laughs> I would drop it, it would be bad. Plus, another reason why I don't like props is because, okay, I talk about my prop, I set it down, I go back to speaking, what are you focused on? On the prop, not my message. And I want you focused on what I'm saying, because I have important things to tell you. Plus, you're, you're distracted, is it going to fall? When's he picking it up again? You're just focused on the prop and not on the message. Drop the prop. Don't use it. You don't need to. Prime example. We, Chelsea and I, we received 1,000 evaluations throughout our training to go for the world championship. And about five or six of them, they said, hey, Ryan, you should bring bunny slippers on stage so we know where your mom is standing at all times. And they could not have been more wrong because they were yellow. <laughs> and how many people thought they were yellow? Raise your hand. Not one person. But I would, I would have lost all of you, right? If it was yellow. Instead, it was all of our stories. What colors did you see? Pink. What else? Blue. White. Brown. I mean, all, they were all your slippers. Some of you saw them fluffy. Some of you saw the ear down. They're really embarrassing. 
It's really embarrassing. Please don't wear bunny slippers. <laughs> I'll share a quick little story. Right after, uh, right after we won, my, we took photos for like three hours. We were exhausted. And my mom was there in Orlando. And she had never seen that speech before. I wanted to give it to her. And after we took photos, I, I had like three hours before the president's dinner, before we had to go and dress in like tuxedos and everything to go into the president's dinner. And she's like, come on, we're going to the outlet malls. And I'm like, what? I do not want to go to the outlet malls right now, mom. This is ridiculous. She said, get in the car. And you listen to your mom. So I'm like in the car. And so she's driving. I'm sitting behind there. And Chelsea's right there. And I'm like, babe, I'm so tired. I go, mom, why are we going to the outlet malls? And she's like, because we're getting bunny slippers. <laughs> And she wanted to walk into the president's dance with bunny slippers on. Thank you, Orlando, for not having those in your outlet malls, because that would have been incredibly embarrassing. So yes, mom, thank you for that. <laughs> She's a great woman. I love her. Next, this was the hardest thing for me to learn throughout our training. And it's speaking in what's called active voice versus passive. No one cares what happened. People want to know what is happening. Keep them engaged. It's our story. It's not your story that you're sharing. And the way that you can do that is the subject does the action versus the action is done by the subject. If you see this nasty little word right here, was, you are in passive voice and you need to get rid of it. Let's try a couple examples here. Okay, this, is, this is really hard, but it, you, can, you can do it. How will, can you change this into active voice? The ball was kicked by Susan. Oh, OK. Y'all got it. That's nice. Okay. Y'all are a lot smarter than a couple other cities I've been to. <laughs> that car was designed by Randy. OK, do you understand how now you are talking in the active voice? That money will, or the money will be given to the grandchildren. We'll get the money. Perfect. I was in Sacramento and one woman was like, absolutely not. <laughs> I go, wow, that's bad for your grandkids. I'm glad I'm not your grandkids. Okay. What are some things that you've learned so far in the simple category? Raise your hand. I'll call on you. <coughs> Nothing. Great. <laughs> yes. Yes. Same theme throughout the whole speech. Thank you. Yes. Have a constant object that you refer back to three times. Thank you. Yes. Have three stories for your body. Three stories for your body. Yes. Can. Drop the props. Drop the props. Yeah. I have, to give you, I have to give Chelsea credit for that. So I used to say, ditch the prop. And then my brilliant coach, one of the best coaches in the world, literally, she said, drop the prop. So I have to give that one to her. That was her line. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Yes. Wherever you pick them up, drop them off. Tie your intro back into your conclusion. Yes, thank you. Engage all five senses. Engage all five senses, especially smell. You know, this can add a new element to your speaking. You can ask yourself, does my speech stink? <laughs> new meaning, right? So when people say, your speech stinks, you go, thank you. OK, yes. I like the write in poem form. I talk fast, so I, I like the fact that it's going to give me a pause. Great. Write in poem form. Good. We're learning stuff. Yes. When you believe something, tell them why. Perfect. OK. When you believe something, it, be able to explain why you believe that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. Is Chelsea a Toastmaster? She asks, is Chelsea a Toastmaster? Yes, she is. <laughs> Chel Woo! <laughs> Would you like to tell them how you became a Toastmaster, my lady? Come on. Woo, Chelsea Avery, everybody. <laughs> so yes, I am actually a Toastmaster. January of 2012, I made a bet. And the bet was, if you win the world championship, <laughs> I will join Toastmasters. <laughs> so 30,000 people compete for this, right? So I was like, this is a great bet. I got this. <laughs> No way is he going to do this. And the main reason I didn't want to join Toastmasters was because I get a little sweaty. I get a little nervous when I speak publicly. So it is a really amazing organization. It really has changed our life, not just with the World Championship, but with 
building confidence, feeling like I can stand on stage better without passing out. I feel a little, little queasy, but I'm doing okay. <laughs> so yes, now I am a Toastmaster, so What's you won. Up? You Thank won. You. Thank you. Thank you. I was just doing my job because I was VP of membership at the time. So. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Woo! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, and by the way, David's gonna be taking photos. A couple people are gonna be taking photos. Say hi to the photographers. Woo! Yeah. I told them they can come up on stage, so make sure you're smiling. Okay, woo, yes. Hey. Yes, engaging the five senses. Yes, engaging the five senses. The highlighter and highlighter. Taking those highlighters, absolutely, yes. Active voice. Active voice versus passive, great, yes. Engaging people's memories. Let it be their story, not yours. Yes, Jeannie. Don't, don't describe your frequently used objects like the audience. Yeah, don't describe your frequently Yes, object. Absolutely. Yes. Have someone else teach the there you go. Good. Have someone else teach you the lesson. Don't be the hero of your own story. I don't care how cool you are. Yes. Make your audience work. Make your audience work without knowing that they're working. All right, we're learning some stuff already, huh? <coughs> You glad you came to this morning? Yeah. yeah? All right, we got a lot more to go. I'm going to give away my new book. It's coming out. You can text SPEAK to 41411. By the way, I've seen a couple of people sneak photos on their phone. You can take photos. I don't care. <laughs> if you want photos, take them. I'm all down for it. Post them on Facebook. Post them on social media. You can use Flash. I don't care. Uh, so take out your phones. Text SPEAK to 41411. 41411. I'm going to be giving away books that way. And I'm also going to be doing free webinars and sending you motivational quotes um, once a week. You can also pre order the book with Chelsea uh, in the back. We'll have order forms. It comes out in April 2014, but the reason it comes out in April 2014, no worries. <laughs> the music, brrr, yeah. The reason it comes out in April 2014 is because it got picked up by McGraw Hill, which I am so excited about. Yes. So McGraw-Hill picks it up, and we wrote together, Jeremy Donovan and I, he's a best-selling author of uh, the, How to Deliver a TED Talk. And what we wanted to do is, how many people think my generation could improve their communication skills? <laughs> yes. So it is really geared towards them, and I, we provide 80 strategies of how to improve their communication mm -hmm. skills at work so they can advance in their career. And we take 10 world championship speeches, and we dissect those speeches and talk about how you can advance in your career through that. So it's called Speaker Leader Champion. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or in the back. And one of you has a form. So you see the Speaker Leader Champion thing like this? On the back has my signature on it. Oh, who has it? It's like Willy Wonka. Oh, who has it? Does anyone have it? Could be in an empty... It's in the chair next to you? You won it! Yes! Awesome! Congratulations! Stand up. What's your name? Faith Fishman. Faith, congratulations. Woo! Yeah, we'll give a round of applause. Faith, what you're going to do is, in the back after this, you're going to talk to Chelsea, and she's going to give you a form, and I'll send you a signed copy in April, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. We keep learning, okay? Next thing you need to know. Impactful. I'm training for my half marathon. I'm on mile seven. I'm rocking out my short shorts. I got Britney Sp ACDC in my headphones. <laughs> and I'm running and I'm running and I break my leg. As I am running, and I, I go home, and I hobble home. I'm like, babe, babe, I broke my leg. I broke my leg. She goes, ah, uh, it doesn't look broken. I go, ah, uh, you're not a doctor. <laughs> so she rushes me to the hospital. And what happened is when I was born, I was born with an extra bone in my knee. And that bone broke off while I was running and jutted through a tendon. Seriously, it was the worst pain I've ever experienced. They they put me in this huge cast and crutches. I'm on drugs because, or I'm on Vicodin, I should say. <laughs> Two very different things. Please do not tweet Ryan Avery's on drugs. That would be bad. 
I am on Vicodin, and my speech is all slurred like this. I'm talking, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't talk like this. Because this happened 10 days before my division contest. And I'm like, how am I going to give a speech when I'm talking like this? I can't do this. And I start complaining. And I start just thinking of all of these excuses. And I'm complaining. I'm complaining. Chelsea goes, babe, stop complaining. Stop looking at the excuses. Start looking at the opportunities. And I was like, when did she become a Hallmark card? <laughs> I said, babe, what possible opportunity do I have with this? I'm in crutches. I'm in more pain. I can barely even move. My speech is slurry, and i got to give a speech in 10 days. No way it's going to happen. She goes, stop. Give me one opportunity you have. And it took me a really long time. When I finally figured one, I thought, the only opportunity I have is to be able to lay in bed for the next three days because I don't have to go to work, and all I can do is work on my, my speech. She goes, all right, there's an opportunity. Give me another one. This is where she turns into coach woman. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, babe. And my message was push past it. So if I go on stage and I show them that I'm pushing past it, there's an opportunity. I'm living my message. She goes, OK, tell me another one. And all of a sudden, they just start flowing out. I just have all these opportunities that come. Isn't that funny how one thing can make you focus on the negative versus all the other positive things in your life? Why is it that one person can ruin your great day Quit looking at the excuses and look at the opportunities. So I, I finally get excited. I'm energized. I go to my division contest. I'm about to go up on stage, and Chelsea, my lovely wife and coach, she grabs me on the shoulders, and she's like, babe, there are a lot of people out there. <laughs> Whew, I hope you're not as nervous as I am. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> The worst pep talk in history. <laughs> but luckily, I gave my, my message. I won the district contest on my crutches. I won the district contest on, in my district on my crutches. And I hobble back up on stage. They call my name. There are 300 people in the audience. I am going to the world championship now. My district governor grabs me on the shoulder in front of everybody. And she's like, Ryan, congratulations. What's your second speech going to be on? What? <laughs> no one, no one told me I needed two speeches for this contest. Why would no one do that? So I'm on stage and I'm like, ha ha, what second speech? And everyone laughs and I'm like, why are you laughing? <laughs> so I, I start really panicking because this speech took me five months to develop. I mean, hardcore, 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. developed. I spent eight hours a day on it, practically. Now I have eight weeks to deliver the world's best speech. Not going to happen. So I go into excuse mode. Have you ever given in a speech before? You go, I'm not topping that. Been there? There's no way I'm topping that message. So I go back into excuse mode and excuse mode. And Chelsea now knows that I need something. She pulls out the big guns. And Chelsea and I, we live our life on four pillars. One of those pillars is to travel. We believe that we say travel to see what else is out there. Because we believe our way is not the only way or the right way. It's just the way that works for us. And it's nice to go see how other people do things. So my brilliant wife decides to take me on a trip here. You ever been here before? If you haven't, you must go. I go, babe, I don't have time to go on a trip. I don't have time to go to the Grand Canyon. She goes, ah, ah, ah. I go, I have to focus on my second speech. She goes, ah, ah, ah. And we're standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon, and this is what she tells me. If you only had one message, and you had to carry that one message, and you had to walk across the Grand Canyon to tell one person, what would that one message be, and who would it be? She is deep, isn't she? <laughs> yeah. But that's the same question I want to ask you. If you want to be impactful, and you could only have one message, that's it, one message, one sentence, one line that you could tell one person, what would you tell them, and who would it be? Would it be somebody you're sitting next to? 
Would it be somebody you want to be sitting next to? Or you haven't seen in a while? Or that you love, or just some stranger even? And what would that one message be? I wish I could tell you I grabbed it instantly, but I didn't. I used Randy Harvey's strategies. Does anyone know who Randy Harvey is here? Okay, Randy Harvey is the 2004 world champion of public speaking. He's my mentor and one of my really good friends. I, I didn't know him a year ago. I was giving my, my club speech and I was videotaping my speech. By the way, you must all the time videotape your speeches. And you must watch them after you videotape them. Okay, <laughs> okay. I have my clients say, yeah, I videotaped him. Did you watch it? No. <laughs> What's the point of videotaping it? <laughs> because you're when you videotape, you're going to notice things that people aren't going to give you feedback on. I used to do this thing. I used to push up my glasses with my nose. How ugly is this? <laughs> so ugly, right? All my glasses people in the room, you know what I'm talking about. I'm like, hey, OK. Wanna... Impactful, all right? Impactful. Impactful. OK? So videotape yourself. Videotape yourself. I videotaped my club contest. And a friend came up to me and said, hey, can I send that to a friend of mine? I said, sure, not a problem. Well, her friend was Randy Harvey, the 2004 world champion of public speaking. And I'm freaking out because he sends me an email and says, I want you to come over to my house. We live 45 minutes away. I have watched his speech over and over and over again because I've dissected his speech. I get to his house. His house, by the way, is an estate. It's not a house. He has seven gardens at his house. He's got a Japanese garden, an orchard, a secret garden. It's crazy. You walk in, you turn to the right, his office is two stories high, 20 foot ceilings, books all around with the sliding ladder like in Beauty and the Beast. Not that I watch Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> but like that, if I was to guess. And he has two leather sofa chairs and a fireplace in his office. And he sits me down he says, why do you want to win the world championship of public speaking? And in my head, I'm like, because I want to be like this guy. <laughs> and I tell him, I say, Randy, I can do this. I know I can do this. I will give you all of my energy. I will do anything and everything you say. I just don't know how to do it. You've been there before? You know you want to do something. You just don't know how to do it? Yeah. He says, fine, I'll coach you. But you have to promise me one thing. I'm like, can I know before I promise it? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. You can never give a speech again. You can only send a message from the heart. You can never give a speech again. You can only send a message from the heart. And I promised him. And Randy showed me some strategies that blew me out of the water. You don't know what you don't know, right? And he just taught me some things that I used and strategies that I used, plus the Grand Canyon story, and I developed trust as a must. I develop all of my keynotes and all of my messages that way. And it's a phenomenal foundation and a core. And without Randy, I would not be here today. OK, next thing that we're going to watch or look at. How many people have heard of Simon Sinek before? A couple people. Doug's in the room. OK, perfect. All right, Simon Sinek, for those of you who don't know, is a brilliant man. He was a professor at Columbia University. He, or he is, he is a New York Times bestseller of this book called Start With Why. He has a great TED Talk. Y'all watch TED Talks, by the way? TED. If you don't, go to TED.com. You need to be watching TED speeches or messages. And Simon wanted to find out what makes those top people so great. Why is it that the Steve Jobs and Dr. Martin Luther King and the Wright brothers, why can they be so fantastic when there are hundreds of other computer companies out there? There were thousands of civil rights activists. There were people who were well-funded, well-educated, besides the Wright brothers. Why were they the ones to create flight and create the best computers? And why? Why? And he, he found out that we all ask ourselves three questions. What, how, and why? Those are three questions that we all ask ourselves. So what do you want to do? How are you going to get it done? And why? So a lot of people thought my what, how, why for winning the world championship was 
What do I want to do? I want to win the World Championship of Public Speaking. How am I going to do it? I'm going to enter Toastmasters and enter the contest. Why do I want to win? Because it sounds cool. <laughs> Simon found out that the 1%, the Steve Jobs, the Wright Brothers, Dr. MLK, ask the same three questions, but they do it backwards. They start with why. Why do you want to do something? How will you get it done? What will it give the world? Why do you want to do something? How will you get it done? What will it give the world? So my why, how, what was, why do I want to enter the World Championship of Public Speaking? Because I believe your voice is the most powerful tool on this planet. And I think the people who need it the most is my generation. So how can I do that? I can enter the World Championship of Public Speaking for Toastmasters. I can become the youngest World Champion of Public Speaking in history. And what will that do? Hopefully, that will create some inspiration to my generation to know that they can use their voice also. And they can stop texting, start talking, and build real relationships. <laughs> That is different, isn't it? Yeah. See, what happened was, I am glued to my why. I'm not stuck to a what. And this has been me multiple times, right? I have said, oh man, I had this great idea. And then I go and tell my, my friends and my family, say, that's a horrible idea. You go, you're right. <laughs> because what happens is, we have this what idea instead of this why mentality. And what's going to happen is, when you're stuck in your why, things are going to come at you. Ryan, you can't do that. Ryan, that's never been done before. And they're going to tell you the same thing. You can't do that. You're too old. You're too young. You're too fat. You're too skinny. You're too rich. You're too poor. You can do it. But what you have to identify is why you're doing it. And I'm not just talking about why on stage. I'm talking about why in every area of your life. Why are you in that relationship? Why are you at that job? Why is it that you're here today? Why? Some of you are like, I don't know why I'm in that relationship. <laughs> but I'll find out quick. <laughs> Life's too short. <laughs> right? So start with why. I'm going to share this video with you. I, it will lighten up. The presentation will too. I know we're getting a little deep here. <laughs> but, <laughs> The, the, the video will lighten up as well. I did this video in January 2012, eight months before the World Championship, three months before my club contest. Okay? Hey, todayers. I have officially decided to go for the 2012 World Champion of Public Speaking for uh, Toastmasters. I have titled my speech, Just Jump. And my lovely wife, who's videotaping right now, has allowed me to have a fantastic, uh, what would you call it? A whiteboard? I would call it your dream board. A dream board. And this is where I'm going to develop the speech that is going to win the 2012 World Championship of Speaking. Uh, I've got my goals that I'm listing out, and I've got my uh, things I need for my speech. I just kind of just put this together. So there's a lot more that this is going to see. I just kind of wanted to show you, and we can watch it develop over the next couple months. The competition is in three months. I've got 90 days to train, and I'm going to be asking for a lot of your help and support, ways to make things funny, uh, better vocabulary. We all know that I can do more. Uh, uh, better. There we go. There we go. I guess. I can use the bag of my dad in there, I think. So, uh, this is what I do. I want to show you the next 90 days is on, on, and I'm going to be oh. the world champion for public speaking this year. Uh, All right, well. I share that incredibly embarrassing video with you. <laughs> because Jim Rohn taught me something. And he said, You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. What are you waiting for? Think about that. What are you waiting for? The only person who is stopping you, the only thing that is stopping you is who? You. Yep. Well, not me, but you. <laughs> you. That's it. It's the only person stopping you. The decisions that you make, the things that you tell yourself, you have to believe in yourself. 
This was the whiteboard after I won the world championship. I'm a visual person. Do y'all, any visual people in the room? Yeah. I like to see it. And the most important thing still on this board, out of eight months, it never changed. It said 2012 world champion of public speaking, Ryan Avery. You have to make an impact on yourself first. Before anyone else is going to believe you, you have to believe you. And listen, if you are afraid to write it down, how are you going to get your body to do it? So this is what I do, is I set up visualization stations, or dream boards, I call them visualization stations, because I like to visualize what it is and who I am. And already in January, I was the world champion of public speaking. Look, it's not about winning a trophy, it's about training like one, because when you train like a champion and when you train like the best, you become the best. So don't aim for a trophy, or don't aim to be a champion, train like one. And champions, they believe in themselves, don't they? Champions know they can do it. Champions say, yes, I can. Champions say, I'll do what it takes. And all of you are champion material. All of us are champion material. It's just how we're telling ourselves that. So I wrote that. I even, uh, I even photoshopped the trophy in my hand. And I kept it on my phone. If you go to toastmasters.org, you can see the list of the world champions online. I went to toastmasters.org, I screenshotted it, I moved it down and I typed my name on the top. I printed it out and I kept it in my binder because I believed I was the world champion. And I still do this. I still set up these visualization stations. You can come and see my computer afterwards. Now mine says 2014 New York Times bestseller Ryan Avery. And I put that, th I, I put that there because I have to make an impact on myself first. But it's so funny because I'll share that with people and I've had several emails in the past couple weeks that said, hey Ryan, I just pre-ordered five of your books. I'll, I'll help you become a New York Times bestseller. I'm like, well, I hope you read one of them. <laughs> so it's a very good book. But it is so amazing how people are willing to help you get to where you want to go. People love to help you get to where you want to go. Have you ever asked for directions before? Have people stopped doing what they're doing to try to help you get to where you want to go? Yeah, 99% of this world is phenomenal. We just hear that negative 1% on the news. So 99% of the people want to help you. What the problem is, is you're not putting it out there. You're not telling the important people in your life what it is that you want to do. You're, because you're afraid. You haven't made that decision of what it is that I want to do. And it's costing you. It's costing you a lot of time. And you know what? It's costing us. You all have something inside of you, don't you? You all have something that you can contribute to this world. And it's selfish that you're holding it inside of you. So bring it out. Make an impact on yourself. I still do this. I, this one is embarrassing, uh, but I'll show you. So in my phone, I keep all the people who I want to be friends with one day in here. <laughs> and, in my contact list, so I put fake numbers and, and names. So I've got Anderson Cooper, Tony Robbins, Oprah in here. So then I'm scrolling through here and I'm like, gotta call Oprah today. <laughs> I do that to make an impact on myself first. So when I'm scrolling through here, I'm already friends with Oprah. I'm already friends with Tony Robbins. They have my number, I have theirs. Because if I can't put their fake number in here, you think I'll ever get their real number? Probably not. And I, I was doing this, uh, the same thing. I told this story in Austin about six months ago. And I was saying, you know, Tony Robbins, Les Brown. Y'all know who Les Brown is? Yeah. Okay, number one motivational speaker in the world. And some guy comes up to me afterwards and says, hey, I know who Les is. I have his phone number. Would you like to talk to him? <laughs> yes, that would be nice. Thank you. Les and I talked a couple months ago, and we're putting on a workshop together next year. Oh. Right? You just have to put it out there. People love to help you. So anybody who knows Oprah, let me know afterwards, okay? <laughs> Put it out there. Make an impact on yourself first. What were some things you learned in that category and impactful? Raise your hand and I'll call on you. Yes? Keep a dream board. Keep a dream board. Set up your visualization stations. That's great. Yes? Don't look at the excuses. Look at the opportunities. Don't look at the excuse. Look at the opportunities. I'm going to share a quick story about this. Chelsea and I were in Egypt. And we're in Egypt, 
the pyramids are about to close, and the woman that we're with who brings us out there pays off the pyramids so we can have a private tour of all three of them. We get into the Great Pyramid. It is, I mean, we have a private tour of the pyramid. It's all by ourselves. We're in there, and the first thing I decide to do, I don't know why I do this, but I'm like, I got to lay in the tomb. Which, <laughs> Don't ask me why, I know that's really disrespectful, but I was like, I'm never gonna get this opportunity again. So I lay in the tomb, five seconds later, lights go out. <laughs> Promise you, lights go out. The darkest dark you can possibly imagine happens to us. And then Chelsea's face, the lights come back on, Chelsea's face is like, <gasps> and I'm like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> and <laughs> we run out of the pyramid, well, we kind of like crawl out of the pyramid, we're having this awesome time, I'm thinking, oh my gosh. I just had the pyramid to myself. I'm in my 20s. I'm in Egypt. This is fantastic. I'm with my wife. And all of a sudden, these four little boys run up to us. And they are dirt poor. Dirt poor. They are trying to sell us sand that I can pick up myself. They just need money. They need something. And I realized, OK, in America, even in Canada, America, the Nor in North America, we don't have any excuses, especially in America. We have zero excuses. If you are here in this country right now, you have zero excuses. Those boys might have excuses, yeah. And all those, all those people who just stood up, all of our veterans who stood up for us, like I get chills, I could cry every time to think that you've protected me and my wife and all of my friends. We have zero excuses. We only have opportunities here in America. So if you're sitting here, I don't want you to ever think of an excuse again. Okay, deal? Deal. Okay. Cool, thank you for bringing that up. Okay, who next? Yes. To focus on your dream and believe in yourself. Focus on your dream and believe in yourself. Thank you, yes. Start with the why. Start with the why, right? Start with the why. Yes. Yep, all the way back. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Just start, right? People will help you. You don't have to be great to start, just start. Yes? 99% of people want to help you, so you're selfish to hold it in. Yeah, you're selfish to hold it in, because 99% of the people in this room want to help you. Thank you. Yes? Videotape yourself. Mm. Videotape yourself and watch yourself on the video. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes? Your how is how to help the world. How to help the world. What will it give the world? What will it give the world? Also, why that why is so important is you can't help the world until you're solid. You can't give what you don't have. So until you're solid, until you know your core and you know who it is, you can't do anything. Yes? OK, this is a really important one, right? Do never give a speech again. Only send a message from the heart. And after this, we're gonna, there's a backdrop back there that I want you to come and take a photo with me. We're gonna post it on Facebook afterwards on How To Be A Speaker's Facebook page. And on the back it says, speak from your heart and the world will listen. All of your notes, all of the things that we're talking about today, if this stays here, we all lose. Right? Your voice is the most powerful tool on the planet. You gotta share it. Share it on Facebook, share it with your friends and your family. Go out and tell them how to be better speakers. Because see, what, what being a better speaker does is it helps you be a better person. Helps you be a stronger leader. Speaking is the best thing you can do. So come back there and we'll take a photo. You said you wanted me to repeat something? Oh, I wanted you to repeat something, but now I don't Okay. <laughs> no, now she doesn't remember. Perfect. Anything else before I move on? Yes. You don't have to be great to start. You don't have to be great to start. You just got to start to be great. Thank you. Who else? Good? Yes. Be yourself. Hmm. Be you, right? Be you on or off stage. One of my favorite quotes is from Eleanor Roosevelt. She says, do what you love because people are going to criticize you anyways. <laughs> so just be you, do what you love. I love to speak. Speaking is the best job in the world, hands down. You get to teach, make an impact. You get to share with people what it is that you do. You get to use your voice to make a difference. It's awesome. OK, I am going to give away my best selling product. Sounds like a plan? Oh my gosh, does that sound like a plan? Okay, 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 good. All of you who wanted to stay standing and remain standing at the beginning of this, I have a How to Be a Speaker Home Study course that I have put together with Dr. Harvey. That's available for you today. 
I only have 20 of these on site. And you have an order form in front of you, and you, the first 20 people to get it to Chelsea, she's right there, but she'll be in the back afterwards, will get one of these today. These aren't available online. It's 20 today. If, did, did I help you learn something today? Okay, let me continue to help you. Let me help you get here. Let me, let me and Dr. Harvey help you get paid to use your voice and send a message that matters and speak with confidence. Let us do that. So I'm going to give one of these away today. And how I'm going to do that is, it's, by the way, it's eight DVDs and eight CDs and a workbook. So it's a home study course that you can watch on TV. But then if you want, you can just plug it in your car and listen to it. So this is the best course on the market, and I'm giving it to you today. And I'm going to do that by, pull out your order forms. Okay. By the way, you have to fill out your order form completely when you give it to Chelsea. OK, one of you has my signature in the signature line. Who is it? Ooh, it might be in another empty chair. Dun, da, da, da. Somebody has it, who has it? Maybe not, maybe we'll have to go another route. All right, I'm gonna take five more seconds, and if nobody has it, then I am going to do another thing. It's a signature on the signature line. You have it? All right, nice, come on up here. Come on up. Woo, nice, congratulations, come on up, come on up. What's your name? I'm Brian. Brian, good name, by the way. Good name. Thank you. What do you do? I'm an engineer. Engineer, OK. And what are you here today to learn about? Uh, how to be a better speaker. How to be a better speaker. Awesome. Well, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to watch this first DVD. The first DVD is the strategies and techniques that Randy taught me and have completely changed my life. And okay. if, if you don't do anything else, watch this first DVD because it is invaluable. OK? All thank right. you. I'm so glad you won it. Thank hey, you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, you still ready to learn some more? Yeah. Okay, next thing, last thing, relatable. We have simple, we have impactful, and we have relatable. Were those messages that I shared with you at the beginning simple, impactful, relatable? Is this, today, this presentation, is it simple, impactful, relatable? Yeah. Everything you do when you speak on stage is simple, impactful, relatable. Let's keep learning some little things that can make a big difference. How many parents do we have in the room? Parents? Parents, you fail. <laughs> I love this photo. <laughs> I share it in most of my workshops. I was in the Bahamas a couple months ago, and I've shared this a hundred times, and until the Bahamas, someone was pointed out, really, a Dish Network box? <laughs> and I never noticed that they were sitting on a Dish Network box. Okay, the reason I share this with you is, never tell a joke again, only share a failure. You want to be relatable, share a failure. You want to seem washed up and, and used, Share a joke. You want to share a failure, OK? And the reason why is because failures come with lessons, but also failures, they cannot be told by anybody else. Those failures people can relate to, right? Like a couple months ago, OK, I have been learning so much about wine lately. Wine fascinates me. It blows my mind that someone can be like, oh, that's a 1998 and they can smell it, and they can tell me it's a 1998. Any wine drinkers in the room? Wine, what's up? Some people are like, yes, me. OK, so I've been learning a lot about wine for business purposes and for me, and I have a wine app on my phone. I've been going to wineries. I mean, I've been doing anything and everything I can to learn about wine. And Chelsea doesn't really know this at the time, so I take her to a really fancy restaurant so I can impress her. So I take her to this really fancy restaurant, and the wine sommelier comes by, and he's like, monsieur. What can we get you to drink? And I go, babe, I got this. 
I said, sir, we'll take a nice red wine, please. <laughs> <laughs> and the wine sommelier goes, monsieur, that's a great choice. What kind of red wine would you like? And I said, sir, we'll take a Chardonnay. <laughs> For all of you who don't drink wine, <laughs> Chardonnay would be a white wine. And I was trying to explain to Chelsea, no, 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 I really knew a lot about wine, I promise. She was like, mm-hmm, so I embarrassed her. Right, just a simple story like that is relatable. Have you ever messed up with your partner before? Okay, no matter, <laughs> Ken's like, yes, uh-huh. No matter what, when you share a failure, there will be people who can relate to that but they cannot tell it the exact same way as you, so it makes it original. And you're not telling some used joke that's been heard multiple times before. So you come across as original. And it comes with a point, right? Share your failures, don't tell a joke. When you see this photo, I want you... <laughs> Are these a lot like your family? <laughs> Do all, have y'all heard of that blog called Awkward Family Photos? It's a book. I love that book and that blog. I could spend hours on that all day. But I want you to look at this photo and I want you to think who you identify with in the family. <laughs> okay. so this would be Chelsea, she loves her shiny toys. It's like, what's up, I'm playing everything. This is me, I'm like, I'm ready for my photo, let's do this. But often, I am this guy who's like, really? <laughs> this is the family you gave me? Oh. Prime example, a couple months ago, I'm in Moscow, and it's my parents' 40th wedding anniversary, so I want to take them to Russia with me because I'm giving a speech out there. We're in the hotel room, and my mom is talking on the phone, it's like $8 a minute, and she's talking on the phone, she comes back out, and she's smiling, and I go, Mom, what you smiling about? She goes, I was just bragging about you and your new book coming out. I was like, aw, Mom, thank you, what else were you talking about? She goes, you know, I was just telling everybody how great of a twerker you are. <laughs> I said, excuse me, what, mom? She goes, yeah, I was telling everybody how you're twerking all over the United States. And how it's inappropriate sometimes to be twerking at the dinner table. And I was like, what are you talking about? Why would you tell people that? And she goes, whoa, 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 why are you getting so defensive? I go, what do you think twerking means, mom? And she goes, I don't know, I thought it was that thing you do on the phone with the 140 characteristics. <laughs> mom, do you mean a tweet? Yeah, what's the difference? A big difference, mom. A very big difference. And if you don't know what twerking is, I will not show you what twerking is. Please ask your neighbor. <laughs> so that's where I come in and I go like this. And I love my mom, she's amazing. She helps. <laughs> We're on a 50 city tour right now. Chelsea and I, we're gone for six months. We're traveling North America and doing this workshop all around because we want to help our generation improve their communication skills. And without my mom, she's our assistant back home and she helps send out emails and push out product. And without her, we literally could not be doing this tour. So I know I pick at her, but uh, she's an amazing woman. And I, I think that's a good point. I should touch on this a little bit. The reason why I share this with you is because if you want to be relatable, use your family. <laughs> because we all have families, don't we? Whether you don't like your family or not, I have one, I have one client that I worked with at the beginning, and I, I was telling her, you know, you've got to use your family, and you've got to make sure that you leave them up on a pedestal at the end. Because no matter what, family is the most important thing. So you have to make sure they are on the pedestal, they are the greatest, your mom, your dad, everybody is the best at the end. Make fun all you want, but make sure they're up on a pedestal. And she goes, Ryan, I'm not doing that. I said, why? She goes, I hated my mom. My mom was horrible to me. And I told her, I said, look, I understand. I understand how some people don't have good families. I'm not asking you to say you love your mom, but what I am asking you to do is there's a difference because all the things your mom did, she still taught you. And now you know how to be a mom because of what you don't want to do. And you have to showcase that. 
You have to tell you, you have to tell people that I learned that from my mom, and you still gotta leave her up on a pedestal. Because family first and family is the most important thing. But the reason why I share family with you is because there will be an opportunity one day when you speak in front of thousands of people, or even five. And when you do, there's gonna be different generations different sexual orientations, different religions, different skin colors, everything. And the number one way to relate to them is by sharing a family story, because we all can relate to an embarrassing mom story, right? <laughs> yes, I hope so. <laughs> so use your family and be relatable that way. All right, next thing. How many people have heard of the saying, dress to impress? Yeah. I don't like that saying. I like dress to relate. My job is not to impress you. My job is to relate to you. I don't want to impress you. I want to let you know that if you want what I have, if you want to continuously learn, if you want to be on stage, if you want to use your voice to make a difference, I can take you there. I promise you I can take you there. But the difference is, is when I come up here and I dress all fancy and sharp dress and I don't know who my audience is, right? I know who my audience is. It's a weekday, it's in the morning, it's cold outside. I know majority of what the audience is going to be wearing and what they're going to be looking like. And if I come up here and I was in a fancy, nice suit and I was like, hey everybody, let me tell you how successful I am. <laughs> you would not listen to me because the first thing we do is we judge someone by the way they, they look. That's never gonna change. We judge them by the way that they look. And you can, you can help that by not letting them judge you, by relating to how they look as well. I'm not saying change who you are, I'm just saying relate and adapt. Prime example, like I, I like nice clothes. I wear Calvin Klein and I wear Cole Haan shoes, that's fine. But I was giving a speech to sophomores, a different group. I don't know why I speak to sophomores. <laughs> but yeah, the challenge, I like the challenge. <laughs> I'm speaking to hundreds of sophomores at a camp and it's about how to be successful. Two guys go up before me, and they're in fancy suits. And these kids, they're, they're tweeting, and they're really tweeting, they're not twerking. Uh, they're tweeting, they're not even paying attention, and these guys are like, hey everybody, here's how successful I am. <laughs> and they do say some good things, and they do tell you how to be successful, but what I was noticing is there was that big disconnect between them. It was more of a, I can't be like him because I don't look like him. And so I was the last one to go up and I was over here and the camp director was sitting right there and I said, hey, do you have one of those shirts that everyone's wearing? Because all of them were in the same shirt. And he goes, yeah. So I ran back, put it on, I came up on stage, I paused for a little bit, all the heads popped up and they were like, does he go to our camp? Talking, <laughs> it was this presentation. And I had every sophomore engaged. They were taking notes, they were listening, they were laughing, they were asking me questions because right at the beginning I built, I built rapport with them and I looked like them. I just, I just dressed to relate. That's the best thing that you can do when you're meeting someone is just dress to relate. Know, right? It's know who you're talking to. <coughs> Next thing. In big, hefty letters, I want you to write this one word. In, I'm talking bold letters, okay? Big, big letters. I want you to write the word practice. <laughs> and underneath that, I want you to write how you practice is how you will play. What's the definition of insanity by Albert Einstein? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Exactly. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's insanity. If you're going up and you're just practicing or you're not learning from other people, you're not reading books, you're not watching DVDs, you're not coming to seminars like this, which is great, you're not gonna grow. You're gonna stay there. You're gonna be where you are for the rest of your life. So you have to expand yourself. You have to practice. You have to learn from people who have already been where you wanna go. You have to get out on stage more. I would practice, I would tuck my shirt deep in, I'd tuck my shirt in my pants, I'd hike my pants up, I'd hike, I'd part my hair to the side, and I would give that push past it speech in the middle of downtown Portland, Oregon. So people thought I was homeless and they'd throw money at me, thought it was crazy. <laughs> Made some pretty good money, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> but the reason I did that is because I wanted to feel uncomfortable. 
and I realize if I can still deliver my message in that uncomfortable setting, think what I can do when I'm on stage in clothes that I like to wear, people ready to listen. How do you think that message will resonate with my audience? Pretty good, right? So that's why you do sophomore. <laughs> that's why, I, exactly, I like that challenge. Yes, yes, yes. But you have to practice. How you practice is how you play. And there's going to be times that you mess up. I'll, I'll share this story with you. Uh, I'll share this story. With, I don't like sharing it because it was a big mistake on my part. But it taught me something. So right after I won the world championship, I got those 269 emails and my life changed forever. I was flying to Alaska and the Bahamas and Canada. I was making more money in one hour than I was making in months. Well, I worked at a nonprofit, so that doesn't really count. <laughs> <laughs> but I was making money. I was traveling with my wife. I, my ego grew. It did. My ego grew. And it grew, and unfortunately, um, I got to the point where I was making a lot of money in this one organization. They asked me to come out and speak for free. And I was like, fine, I'll donate my time now. I donate my time, and four people show up. I'm like, four people are here? Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so I do my thing, I do my speech, and I walk off stage. And this one woman, she comes up and she taps me on the shoulder and she says, excuse me, and I said, yes. She says, don't waste my time like that again. I said, excuse me? And she goes, you weren't here for us. You were here for you. And you are not welcome back again. Oh, you ever do something, even a shower doesn't make you feel clean? <laughs> oh, it was one of those moments that I am so, I hated going through, but I loved it because it slapped me back into who I am. And there's gonna be times when you get off course, but you need to have those people in your life like Chelsea and Randy and my family and the people who I love supporting me and getting me back to where I was. So look, whether there are 4,000 people in the room or there are four, you give them the same amount of energy, the same amount of respect because you don't know if those four people need it more than those 4,000. Give it all. I was in a Toastmaster meeting a couple months ago and it was a 6 a.m. morning meeting. Morning people in the house, what's up? Chelsea's like, nope, not gonna do it. <laughs> I, I went, six people showed up, and you know, in Toastmasters, we got our little evaluations. Not little, they're fantastic. I'm giving, by the way, tangent, I am giving a new keynote next week, and I, I asked if some Toastmasters would help me, and six Toastmasters showed up last night here in Grand Rapids, to, or in Lansing, to help me, and that's what Toastmasters is all about, right? That's awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. They gave me some great feedback. But when I was in that six o'clock meeting, they said, all of them said, Ryan, you have a little too much energy this morning. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I can deal with too much energy. I can deal with too much energy. So you have to practice because you have to make those mistakes and you have to learn from them. Okay? What were some things that you've learned in this part and relatable? Share your failures. Share your failures. One of my favorite and I, I was honestly really depressed a couple days ago when Nelson Mandela died because I think he's a phenomenal man. And one of my favorite quotes from him is, don't judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell and got back up. And that man to me is, I'm literally so upset that he is off this planet because that man was, no words. So thank you for sharing that one. Yes? Share a failure. Yeah, share a failure. Absolutely, thank you. Don't do it for you, do it for them. Don't do it for you, you were there for them. Absolutely, yes. Uh, how you practice is how you will do. How you practice is how you will play. Great, Dress yes. To Dress to relate, thank you. It's not about how many people show up, for your speech. it's how many people you impact. Cool, it's not how many people show up to your speech, it's how many people you impact. Great, yes. Use your family, Use your family. they're there. <laughs> Use it, thank you. Yes? Don't waste people's time. Our most precious resource. Did all of you learn something today? Yes. Okay. All the three people too who set up, you learned something? Good. And all you 50 bucks? <laughs> thank you. Great. Yeah, it, it's your, your most precious time, is, or your most precious resource is time. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yes? Make sure you leave your family at the top. Ah, make sure you leave your family at a pedestal. Yeah, absolutely, at the top. Thank you. Yes. Make sure you purchase 
<laughs> nice plug. I'll give you that twenty dollars later. That I, I didn't pay him to say that. I didn't pay him to say. That. But honestly, it, if you learn something today, I can teach you a lot of things that can change your life, and that kit will change your life. I have a hundred percent money back guarantee on that kit, so there's no risk to invest in yourself today. If you don't like it, you send it back to me, and any time, it will change your life. I guarantee it. Invest in yourself. What else? You learn some stuff? No? Okay, I have time for th three questions. Yes? You started to tell us my four life pillars. Oh, okay. I got travel, but I don't believe I heard it anymore. I don't, yeah, uh, he asked me, I shared one of my pillars, and he wants to know the other four with Chelsea and I. Sorry, I, I was just on a roll. The, other, the four pillars that we live by, and it's quick, you have to identify the things that are important in your life. So Chelsea and I, there was one day when we were that dirt poor broke, you know, we had $84 in our bank account. We were about to get on food stamps, I was about to move in with my parents, it was a really rough period in my life. Anyone been broke before? Yeah, sucks. And we were, we were broke, and we, decided, we got the call from Nike, because I got a job with Nike, and they paid me in advance so I could pay rent. But right there, we identified, okay, we never want to get in this situation again. We want to identify what success is to us, and we want to be successful. We don't want to attain success. Does that make sense? Like you want to feel successful your whole life. It's, not some, it's a journey. It's not like, hey, there, I'm successful. What we decided is, what would make us feel successful all the time? Like, if we were doing these things, we felt successful. And these are our four pillars. So it's, we live, give, save, and travel. I'll explain these. We live, give, save, and travel. Live a happy and healthy life. If we do something and we can't say, will this make us happy or healthy, we don't do it. We have identify what it is that we want to do. We give 10% of our money away to good causes or um, we buy people's groceries, or just anything. I feel like if you can't live off of 90% of what you're making, you're doing something wrong. The average American donates 2% of their income to good causes. Think if we all gave 10, how better this world would be. And I remember my friends being like, man, when I'm a millionaire, I'm gonna start donating. Yeah. Bless you. <laughs> that, was, that was awesome, Sinise. That was good. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> my, because my belief is, if you give more, you get more. And we wanted to not wait till we were millionaires to start giving. And I, I promise you, once we started giving, it changed our life. We actually make more money now because we give, because our mind is focused on other things. So live, give, save. Save for tomorrow. There will be times when you are down. There will be times when you're out of money or out of a job, or there will be times when... Something goes wrong. Even, I mean, Chelsea and I, I feel very successful. And there will be times when I'll make $10,000 and then I'll lose $20,000. But my savings helps me still pay rent and travel and save for tomorrow. And then live, give, save, and travel. Travel to see what else is out there. Those are our four pillars that we live off of. Thanks for asking that. Yes? How do you do when you have a really diverse, really diverse audience and you don't know anything about it and they are plus, they are negative, they look negative. Mm. They look negative? Like they're like... Yeah, like morning without coffee. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So he's saying, how do you interact with an audience that's very diverse and in the morning? <laughs> okay, I want you to take some notes, okay? <laughs> you make it simple, you make it impact... I, I know, I'll repeat it. You make it simple, you make it impactful, you make it funny. You don't waste their time when you come up and say, look at this, this is a morning on a Saturday, there's 250 people in the room, and did I engage you? Yeah. Were you ever bored? No. No, okay, so uh, there's no, nothing different you need to do. That is really it. You can be simple, impactful, relatable. There are a lot more things you need to do to keep them engaged. There are a lot more things you need to do to get on stage. That's why I put that kit together, right? You can't just use this formula and think you're good. You've got to do a lot more. There's a lot more to it. But if you do these three things, that can be a good start. Okay? All right, another question? Yeah, sorry. You 
Great question. So she's saying, what do I have in the kit? The kit is made up of eight DVDs. It's, um, the first DVD is Randy Harvey's strategies of how to be you and how to be on stage and use your, like, it's about speaking from the heart. And he teaches you how to find that message that matters to you and deliver it. And then we have a DVD on how to be funny. We have a DVD on how to be confident. We have a DVD on NCD, how to write and deliver a speech, how to engage your audience. And then we recap two, um, and two different speeches and dissect those together. And one of the bonus DVD is how to make $500 by next week. And it's three strategies of how to make $500 that I actually used and implemented. Look, you don't have to be the world champion to make money. How many professional speakers are there that aren't the world champion? What you have to do is identify what's inside of you, what credentials you have, which you do have, that you can use. And that's what I teach in that kit with Dr. Harvey. It's brilliant. Look, take it home today. If you don't learn something from it, you send it back to me. And I'll pay you full with it. You won't, but I'll do that if you want me to. OK. I want to end with this. Before I end with this, I want to remind you, I'd love for you to fill out a testimonial form if you learn something, if you know a corporation or organization, and turn it in the back with Chelsea. I want you to come and take a photo with us. And I want you to thank District 62, please, again. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to end with this. We all agreed your message matters, correct? Yes. The question that I want you to think about is, what will you do with it? What will you do with your message? Who will you help? What will you do to craft it, to deliver it, to get on stage and actually use your voice? I want you to think about that. I want you to find your why. And no matter what happens, wherever you go, I want you to remember these last two words, OK? Whatever happens, whatever mistakes you make, there will be troubles that come along the way. And I just want you to remember these two words, that shirt happens. <laughs> Thank you, District 62. Thank you, Grand Rapids. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation, Ryan. I certainly learned a lot. I'm sure we all did. And District 62 would like to give you a little present. Uh -huh. Books, my favorite gift. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. Thank Let's you. Another round of applause, and I have a couple of notes yeah. to make. Thank you so much.